Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 118 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today we've got an interesting assortment of animals, we've got some subspecies, we've got uh, a couple birds, we've got a reptile and a few mammals and things like that. So we've got a very interesting assortment of animals today, a couple remasters as well, which I'm quite excited to get stuck into. So yeah, we're going to be starting off with a uh, reptile. We've got a new monitor coming in. We have got by Scott and uh, Leaf, we've got the yellow-headed water monitor. Or Varanus coming nigh, which also named as the Cummings water monitor or the Miranda water monitor and the Philippine water monitor. I'll use the Philippine one from now on because I think it's the easiest. So these guys are a species of monitor lizard uh, in the species uh, Varanidae, so related to things like the water monitor, uh, Komodo dragons, lace monitors, things like that. But um, these guys were previously considered uh, a subspecies of the water monitor, uh, which is Varanus salvadori, which is already in game. But in 2007, they were kind of given their own species, so these guys are their own species of monitor. And their name, or the science scientific name Cumming Nye, comes from the English chronologist and botanist uh, Hugh Cumming, so that's where they got the species name from. And in terms of their description and their range, these guys uh, kind of live in the southern Philippines. So they're found in uh, Mindaro and a couple of the smaller islands around the southern Philippines there, which is quite cool. And um, in terms of description, they have the high highest degree of yellow coloration in among all the endemic water monitors of the Philippines. So quite, quite, uh, as you can see, quite yellowish, and they get the name Yellowhead. And these guys are quite a large lizard, so they're medium, uh, medium-sized monitor lizards, so they're kind of in between, but they're quite large compared to most lizards. The largest specimens have been known to reach about 1.5 meters or about 4 foot 11 and have a snout to vent length, so that's the tip of the nose to their cloaca, is about 60 centimeters or 24 inches and uh, way up to about 25 to uh, 20, uh, 2.5 or 55.5 pounds in weight. So definitely a sizable lizard, definitely don't want to mess with it too much. Not quite as big as obviously the Salvadora and things like that, but still a decently sized animal. So in terms of these guys' habitats, these guys live in kind of mangroves and moist forests, but they also can be found in cultivated areas and also fish ponds. And these guys have quite a varied diet. These guys will feed on rodents, birds, crustaceans, uh, mollusks, fishes, invertebrates, and also eggs and carrion. So they're on that seafood diet. As they see food, they will eat it. So definitely a very interesting animal in that regard. Not too different in terms of diet from other monitors. They're also considered least concerned, which is a good thing. And they were actually considered, there used to be two subspecies, so there was Kaminai Kaminai, which is the one that we're describing here from Miranda, and then there was the Samarensis, which came from Bohol, uh, Samar, and Lienti, but they've been given their own species name, uh, Varanus uh, Samarensis, so that's quite interesting in that regard, but you can see they get their bright yellow head, it looks so beautiful. Uh, uh, Scott did a really wonderful job, he's done with like some exhibit animals before, and uh, really nice to see... Uh, Nice monitor lizard. I really, I think he's working on a parenti. I'd really love to see a parenti, a uh, nice, good parenti come out. And then we can have a look at the cute little babies. You can see uh, real yellow heads and cute little uh, features for this guy. So cute. I really do love these little guys. And you can see there's kind of some variation there. You can see that one's got quite the yellow head. This one doesn't have a yellowish head. There's some variations there, which is really, really cool. And you can see the, like, the individual scales and everything. Just looks so amazing. I'm definitely a big fan. So Scott and Leith. Scott definitely did a great, uh, great job with this one. So next up, we've kind of got the end of an era coming up because we have the last crane that was supposed to... Uh, coming into Planet Zoo. So now we have the Hooded Crane, which is done by Ginger Toast. So this is kind of end of the era, as I mentioned. Last crane to be added in the game. So now we have all the cranes in Planet Zoo, which is quite cool and really, really awesome animals. So the Hooded Crane, or Gurus uh, Monarcha, these guys are a crane that are native to East Asia and migrate a lot into Japan. So you can see they've got this real grayish body to them and the top of the neck is white, except for that bare red uh, kind of spot there above the eye that's what gives them their name so that's where they get the name the hooded crane and as well as this as well i think is that they get their name uh they're actually one of the smaller species of cranes but they are still a very large bird they get to about a meter tall and about uh 3.7 kilograms or about eight pounds and their wingspan about 1.87 so a wingspan of about a little over six foot so why why was small for a crane they're still a definitely big bird they're over a meter tall and got almost a two meter wingspan it's a very big bird um 
really really cool so in terms of their distribution these guys can be found breeding in south central and southeastern siberia and even suspected in mongolia and over 80 percent of its population kind of uh, when it's after it's bred they uh, winter in uh, southern japan but they'll also winter in china and uh, south korea uh as well there's about a hundred hooded cranes wintering in the uh chongming dotan shanghai every year so there's like a big reserve uh where a lot of them will go out and live and there's also uh there was a hooded crane actually seen overwintering in uh, the hishwasi reserve in southeastern Tallis, tennessee which was really really weird uh, well outside of its uh, northern range uh, its range also one seen at uh the goose pond in southern indiana which has been seen in america so that's really weird so there are some vagrants that come over to america so that's really really interesting and several have been seen in the philippines as well so it shows that while these guys mainly winter in like japan and in the south korea places like that they've been seen to and quite often in uh the u.s which is really really interesting and um they've been recorded migrating to this country and usually like wetlands and things like that but in terms of their um the estimated population they are considered vulnerable but their population is estimated to be about 1000 11 11600 individuals but the major threats these guys face are very similar to most other threats that a lot of other cranes face that includes habitat degradation and wetland loss in their wintering grounds in China and South Korea as a result of de developments like dam building and reclamation things like that but there has been some conservation ac uh, action taking place especially since 2008 and uh, local universities, communities, and non-government -gov organizations are working together to try and create better wintering locations for these guys because their wintering locations are where there's the most development. And they are evaluated as vulnerable and are considered uh, Appendix 1 and 3, uh, 1 and 2 by CITES. So pretty much like protected, can't deal with them. Be a really, really cool. Nice to see the cr another crane. Really, really awesome to see the cute little baby there. I just quite like being able to... Uh, say that we have all the cranes in the game now and ginger toast has also also done a wonderful job with us definitely a big fan so next up we've got a remaster of an older mod we've got hoffman's two-toed sloth done by leaf tnt and good boy so really nice one here really really cool so the hoffman's two-toed sloth which is also known as the two-toed sloth is uh, a species of sloth from central and south america as you can kind of see that as we mentioned last time we had the Linnaeus two-toed sloth these guys are a little bit more different with the uh pink nose rather than the brown nose a uh, black nose and they've got a little bit bigger i think a little bit light, lighter as well so these guys are quite a heavily built animal and they have shaggy fur and slow deliberate movements and like the um like the other two-toed sloth, they have the two big claws on their forelimbs that they use to kind of grab on branches, things like that. And that also distinguishes them from the three-toed sloth. And they actually have some really interesting adaptations uh, to allow them to kind of hang and move slowly. That includes things like uh, the loss of contact on the ulna as well for some uh, attachments, things like that. And that's really, really cool. But they are quite easy to confuse with the Linnaeus ones. But the most physical differences is typically like some subtle skeletal features. But on the face of it, you can kind of see like the black face is kind of a different one as well. But these guys can get quite big. They range from 54 to 72 centimeters or 21 to 20 inches in head to body length and weigh between 21 and 9 kilograms. So 46 to 19 pounds. So that's quite big. They have short stubby tails, but they have quite long fur. And uh, their claws is about 5 to 6.5 centimeters or 2 to 2.6 inches with females on average being larger than the males, although they do curve like quite a bit. And you can see that fur is quite tan when light in color, but they usually have a greenish tinge because they have algae living in their hair, which is really cool. So the Hoffman's two-toed sloth, they live in tropical forests from sea level up to th uh, 3,300 meters and can be found in a uh, rainforest canopy in two separate areas, which is really interesting. One population can be seen in Honduras and Ecuador into like Western Brazil and, and and also with Ecuador, and then the south they can be found in Peru, western Brazil, and northern Bolivia, which is quite interesting. And it seems, uh, looking at the divergent time of these populations, there's a divergent time of about 7 million years between these populations, and uh, it's been suggested, and it's possible they could actually be different species. I don't think there's much research into that, but it would be interesting to see how that turns out in the future, because that's quite a big divergent time. Uh, Two-toed sloths typically live in the canopies of the tropical rainforests, and... Um, 
as you tend to be relaxing on branches as they climb around do things and most of the sloth activity will take place with them hanging down the tree uh, but they will come down when they need to urinate and defecate they'll climb all the way down to the ground and then also will come down to the ground if they also need to find a new tree to live on or a new like location to live so as i mentioned they spend most of their time in the trees though they may travel on ground sometimes there's actually studies that these guys are almost exclusively nocturnal though in other locations they may be uh Diurnal, so it really depends on the location and is, is suggested to be partly competition with other slots uh, could be other factors maybe like uh, maybe more closer to people so they try to come out at night to kind of avoid them a little bit more which is another big factor they often move slowly through the canopy at about eight hours each night and spend much of their time in tangles i'm gonna think they move very slow like only about 44 0.46 feet per second but can move up to 50 percent faster when excited and although they are solitary in the wild, um, they can be seen with mothers and young, and it's very unusual for two to be in the same tree. And even though sloth is means lazy, the slow movements are actually a really interesting adaptation they have. It's because they are kind of they have a slower metabolism, and they're better adapted for digesting uh, and fermenting food. So basically, it allows them to have half the metabolic rate and be able to um, basically. Uh, survive on less food which is really really cool because they eat a lot of low energy food and due to their low metabolic rates they actually physically respond to uh, hypoxia and similar to other mammals uh, with higher metabolic rates they also have very poor hearing and eyesight and rely almost entirely on their sense of touch to find food and this species is often seen often wobbling their head which is another trait they'll spit often spit when a mouth opens as the uh, survivor will accumulate on the lower lip and give it like a a little bit of an interesting appearance and they use those large hook claws you can see there to basically hook onto the trees and the clinging action actually a reflux so basically when they cling up they'll almost like reflux uh, kind of bring them in which is quite cool and they spend their entire lives in the trees including eating and giving birth things like that and usually they can be found right side up uh, depending on the um, uh, and when they descend to the ground to kind of defecate which is usually every between three to eight days uh, they usually also come down to urinate, chain chains, uh, change trees as they wish, uh, or mate, or give birth, things like that. And while terrestrial locomotion is actually uh, involved, thought to involve soft lying on the ground and pulling the tail forward, they've actually been seen walking on their soles and palms, which is quite interesting. So, uh, sloths will descend once uh, once every eight days to defecate on the ground, and there's been some dairy supporting that. There was with fertilized trees at the base uh, as well. They uh, they cover their feces to avoid predation. They use it for chemical communication. Uh, they pick up trace nutrients in their claws uh, and uh, that they are digested. And then they also favor a mutualistic relationship with the fur uh, moths that live on the fur of the sloths, which is really, really cool. So there's very interesting theories and interpretations of why they only come down. They don't just uh, climb and then poop. Uh, they climb down specifically to poop. There's, there's some theories to prove that, which is quite cool. There's also a new hypothesis that's come uh, emerged suggests that all against previous ones that all current sloths are descended from species that defecated on the ground. And since there hasn't been enough of a selection pressure to actually like abandon this behavior, uh, there's no case for predation due to defecation is actually very rare, which was quite interesting. Uh, but in terms of predation, they also have a few predators. So they have uh, jaguars, uh, predator one by jaguars, cougars, ocelots, margays, harpy eagles, and again, anacondas. And they're threatened, they can defend themselves by using their claws to slash at a predator, uh, and they use their sharp teeth as well. However, their main uh, defense is kind of hiding. So they can survive wounds, they're actually pretty fatal as well, and they have delicate movements and also have the moths and the algae living on their fur that helps them camouflage. So basically their best defense is to hide, uh, and, but they can also like uh, claw and things as well. And their treetop homes, other than most animals, they can't really... Uh, they're safe from most predators, like harpy eagles and things like that. And Hoffman's two-toned sloths kind of live in a range, uh, with a range of different trees, but they prefer uh, Linnaeus and direct sunlight that they use to kind of climb through the trees. Their typical home range is about four to nine acres, or two to four hectares, uh, and many uh, spend most of their lives in just like twenty-five trees or so. In terms of their life history. Uh, the courtship will begin by the female licking the male's face and rubbing his genitals against the male body. Gestation is quite long for these guys, about 355 to 377 days, and usually gives birth to one baby, so they're quite slow breeders. 
The birth will take place either on the ground or in a hanging position, with newborns being born at about 340 to 454 grams, or 12 to 16 ounces. Uh, we'll actually have a look at the baby while we discuss that. Where's the baby? Where's the baby? Little cutie. Uh, they will be born like precocial, so they've already got the long claws and able to cling to their mother's other side pretty quickly. And they begin to take solid food at about 15 to 27 days, and about 9 weeks of age they are fully weaned. And although relatively quiet of adults, uh, young sloths will actually make quite loud calls if they're separated from their mothers. In a captivity, the two toad sloths were seen giving birth ups upside down and uh, actually attempting to pull out their infant uh, using their hind limbs and onto an abdomen. Other sloths were seen hanging uh, under their mothers and infants, like, to protect the infant from falling as well. In terms of their uh, reproduction, though, these guys reach sexual maturity at about two to four years of age, and they've reported to living up to, like, 43 years of captivity, so they're quite a long-lived species, uh, which compensates for being a slow breeder. In terms of uh, their diet, though, these guys will feed on buds, tender twigs, young plant shoots and fruits and flowers, all sorts of leaves. And while they use their lips to tear them up or chew them apart, they have no enamel because their teeth are constantly growing. And they've also been observed using mineral licks, which is quite interesting. And um, they actually cannot synthesize uh, vitamin D through contact with sunlight, so they actually will eat it through their diet. And although they're not true ruminants, they actually have uh, like a ruminant three-chambered stomachs. So the first two chambers will hold the bacteria that helps digest cellulose in their diet. And then the third chamber actually has like the digestive glands and the acids to digest it and the sloth may actually take up to a month to digest a meal and up to two-thirds of a sloth's weight actually be, be, be leaves in its digestive system so they're pretty hefty but a lot of it's just food that they're eating which is quite interesting so in terms of their conservation i believe they are yes they are at least concerned but they do face a lot of the threats that a lot of other animals uh, face and especially in their habitats such as uh habitat degradation so chopping down of trees and things like that but there's really little um like data on that and since people don't often see sloths in the wild because they're up in the trees we don't really have much data which is really interesting and as i mentioned the reproduction of kind of process to sloth being somewhat difficult to compare it's believed that these guys will mate all year round but it seems they like to mate during the uh, rainy season and give birth in the dry season with female carrying their baby for just under 12 months or for five months and they don't actually tend to have one lifelong breeding partner and when they're ready to mate they'll scream and do all that and they'll often congregate in kind of small uh, habitats and allows dominant males to gain many access to multiple females with little effort and the female is the one that's slowly to us uh, only one that takes care of the baby and until they're independent and for the first six to nine months mother sloths will carry their babies on their uh, carry their baby until they're able to go off and do their things on their own and a really cool adaptation is you know they're heterothermic which means they uh, adapt to whatever environment they're in so their body range is typically 30 to 34 degrees celsius that's their internal body temperature which is compared to most mammals is pretty cool and that allows them to keep energy and also they have algae and the fur moths that live in their skin that helps to uh, camouflage them and helps like rainwater and things like that so really really interesting adaptations that they have so really really cool animal definitely a big fan of that so next up this was done by leaf tnt gaboy next up we've got the aleutian red uh aleutian roe deer so this is by uh narwhaler so this is kind of a nice narwhaler mod so let's have a look let's see if you can find the mail there we are so this is the aleutian roe deer so these are a subspecies of roe deer or a population depending who you ask it's a uh, caloris uh, caporis caporis uh, gargantua so these are a subspecies of roe deer that are typically found in southern Spain um, and they can be distinguished by other populations or subspecies as they mark some quite stark sexual dimorphism uh, which is quite more a bit more extreme than other populations and they have a lack of a white marking on their neck uh, as you kind of see that's gone they also have their winter coat year round which makes sense it might be a little bit cooler for them uh, or a little bit warmer so quite interesting in that regard so We'll have a look at the Zoopedia because there's actually not that much information on them. Uh, they've evolved uh, uh, separately due to the particular microclimates of the mountains there where the Atlantic influences increased plant growth in the usual dye area. They're not considered endangered, but their limited range uh, makes the unique population vulnerable to uh, climate change. So that's quind interesting. As you can see, quite a uh, small population. They like, live like right at the Strait of Gibraltar. And then the southernmost population of roe deer, they have uh, shorter and wider skulls. Uh, most of the population reside in the Cerro de Glaza and Los Arcomas populations of the park. 
and due to the exclusive nation they're often called the Aleutian Dujera. And while they're usually considered as uh, valid subspecies nomenclature, some experts consider as an ecotype rather than subspecies, which is, makes sense. But yeah, really, really cool. It depends who you ask. A lot of those uh, divisions are kind of neither here nor there, but you can see the male here with the antlers. Let's have a look at the female. Uh, really, really nice. It's a nice uh, mod as well. Good comparison with the western roe deer that we have uh, in the game already. So that's quite cool. And then we have the little fawns here. Ooh, no, that's not what we wanted. That's going to be for next. A little fawn. How cute. Definitely a big fan. So another really awesome Narwhaler mod. Kind of wish I could find more information on this population, but still quite cool. Uh, really, really cute. So next up, we've got another really cool animal, another subspecies. We have got the Manor Gazelle done by uh, Leaf and Jen. So this is a subspecies of the Arda Gazelle. Oh, that's the baby. Let's see if we can find an adult male. There we are. So these guys are quite a bit different looking than your typical uh, Arda, uh, Dharma Gazelle. So this is the subspecies of the Manor Gazelle. So as I mentioned, they're generally divided into three subspecies. There's the Manor, the Dharma, and the Arda Gazelle. So these ones are the most kind of... Uh, Western most so they live most of the west they can kind of be found West so I think places like Morocco and things like that they lived in Europe uh, um, Not Europe, not Europe. Um, they lived in Morocco parts of Northern Africa in the Middle East and They are the kind of one that has like the most red on its back as you can kind of see there Let's See that look there. That's got the most red on its back You can see it kind of extends all the way through here or the other subspecies typically only have it around their neck these guys are the most reddish and while they are considered subspecies, uh, genetic variation suggests that the valid uh, validity of these subspecies and the variation of their colors or the phenotype of how they look may actually be clinal. So these are the kind of the eastern or the westernmost, and then they kind of go down into the Dharma and the Rufarensis, which is the westernmost, I believe. And that kind of shows like how their uh, coat changes due to their environment because they all encounter different environments. Uh, so these guys are extinct in the wild, sadly. Their last sighting in the wild was in 1968. and But there are present in captive breeding programs such as like in Europe, North America, North Africa, and the Middle East. And they have been reintroduced to similar areas and similar habitats and also former habitat as well. So while considered pretty much extinct in the wild, they do exist still. They're not extinct. They faced a lot of the same threats pretty much as uh, the other subspecies and include... Uh, water and also human threats like de uh, habitat de uh, destruction, uh, also hunting. They were hunted quite well, especially in like civil unrest and other populations, um, things like that. So a lot of the same factors affecting other species affecting these guys. But luckily, uh, there is about uh, in Easy A zoos is about uh, kind of uh, the focus on the Manor gazelle, which is primarily focuses Arda gazelle in America. So most people in Europe are breeding the Manor gazelle. And I believe there's about 293 uh, gazelle included in the stub books of 2014. And there has been some kind of breeding other ones as well. So lots of conservation to try and bring them back in the wild and all that. So really, really cool. And um, let's have a look at the cute little babies as well while we have a look. So really, really cool gazelle. Definitely a big fan. Nice to see some subspecies and stuff getting some representation. And allows me to like, talk about some of the differences and things about them. So that's quite cool. So next up. We've got a remaster. Next one is done by Leaf Gen and Buff Sue. Big, big uh, uh, animal. We've got the coming in. We've got the green sea turtle. Everyone's kind of favorite. So the green sea turtle, uh, also known as the green turtle or the Pacific green turtle, the black turtle, black sea turtle. These guys are a species of sea turtle in the uh, family Chelonidae and the only species of the genus are Chelonia, which is quite cool. So these guys are uh, typical like appearance for a sea turtle. Uh, they have quite a flattened body with a short neck and a big head uh, with paddle-like arms that are well adapted for swimming. You can kind of see that there. Uh, let's see if you can find one swimming to kind of demonstrate that. We'll have a look at you because you're quite cute. Really, really cool. So let you swim and paddle around. So um, adult sea turtles will typically grow from about 1.5 meters or 5 feet long, with the average weight of mature individual being about 68 to 190 kilograms, or about 150 to 419 pounds, and the average carapace length, or the kind of big shell on their back, that can be between uh, 
78 and 112 centimeters so about 31 to 44 inches and exceptional specimens can get quite big there are specimens getting about 350 kilograms or 694 pounds with the largest ever measured being about a 345 uh, kilograms or 871 pounds and measured 153 centimeters or 60 inches in their carapace length so it was an exceptional individual uh, some ways you can kind of tell them apart from other sea turtle species is that they have a uh, very short beak compared to like the hawk's bull turtle and it's quite reduced compared to like um, loggerheads and things like that they've got a very interesting beak that's got for different adaptations and things like that so in terms of the distribution they can be found pretty much all over the world they live in tropical and subtropical areas with two major populations living in the atlantic and the eastern pacific subpopulations with them being quite genetically distinct there's been some research and so they are like they are kind of related to each other and they've kind of descended from each other they're still the same species but they're kind of the two main different populations and they don't mix too much so their native range is pretty much anywhere within like the right thermal cline so they can be found like the mediterranean uh 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south is kind of where they kind of live in so and the differences in microchondrial DNA seems to be like these stem cell populations being isolated for each other uh, for longer periods of time. So like they both isolated from these southern tips of both South America and Africa, where there's no warm water for them to go through. So there is some isolation there, but they can swim around. And the largest population is typically found like in Hawaii and Florida, and also found in like the Great Barrier Reef and the Caribbean Sea. So they're kind of the biggest populations, but they typically live all around those areas. So they're quite... Uh, quite open in that regard pretty much found everywhere and like pretty much any ocean you find them they just don't really live in places like new zealand or uh the southern tips of like africa and uh south america so kind of just as long as it's not too cold you find them there it's really interesting and they each have all sorts of like really really cool uh nesting sites so there's major nesting sites can be found on the caribbean also like Car north carolina and south carolina and florida is really important and also other islands and like the caribbean it's quite important for the atlantic subpopulation and the india pacific uh, indo-pacific population they can be found as the northern tip of new zealand they can be found in tasmania um so they typically breed in hawaii and stuff like that the south pacific uh, also sudan uh, pakistan not sudan india pakistan sri lanka and other coastal countries are quite important for nesting sites which is quite interesting and there's also a population that have been known as the galapagos sea turtle and kind of look a little bit different uh but they if it's paid to them because of the other ones but they have been suggested uh as a different species but there is not really much in terms of their population that's different from them uh though there is some debate whether because they have darker pigmentation things like that and people are like oh are they actually a different species or are they a subspecies or a color morph da, da 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 and um kind of most recent things suggest that these guys are treating them the evidence for the taxonomic position of the Galapagos green turtle was reviewed, and a minority thought of them as a population and subspecies of a green sea turtle. Oh, there is some case where they could potentially be different, but most people consider that Galapagos green sea turtle to be its own kind of population, and not really that distinct other than that. But in terms of its habitat, these guys live across three different habitats. So they lay their eggs on the beaches, and then marine turtles or mature turtles typically spend most of their time in shallow coastal waters, with adults living in bays, lagoons, shoals, and in seagrass meadows. But um, with entire generations where they migrate between one pair of feeding and nesting areas. With green sea turtles, they are considered an aquatic species. It can be found pretty much all over the world, as I mentioned. And they like to stay near continental islands and like coastlines, things like that, where they can go breed. And near the coastlines, they live within shallow bays of protected things, and they like to inhabit coral reefs, marshes, and seagrass beds. And the coral reef will provide algae for them to eat on, and then they'll eat seagrass as well as sea vegetation, things like that. And... They spend the first five or so years of their life in the convergence zones where there's bare open ocean, where it's kind of safer for them. So these young turtles are really seem as they swim in quite deep waters, and they typically can swim at like two to three kilometers an hour, or like, like 1.6 to 1.9 miles per hour. So quite fast swimmers for little guys. So in terms of their ecology and behavior, these are one of the first sea turtle species studied, and uh, we know a lot of these guys, uh, of sea turtles, we, they kind of consider the model, which is quite as cool as well. And quite interesting, they have different niches, so they change drastically with each stage of their life. So kind of the baby ones, we don't really have the baby ones here because they don't have a baby model, but they change a lot as they grow up, which is a really, really interesting fact about these guys. Let's have a look at you on the land. Where's the other one? There's got to be someone here somewhere. 
Where's the adults? Well, you're an adult. We'll, we'll go with you then. Anyway, in terms of their diets, so the diets of green sea turtles change with age. So as juveniles, they're carnivorous, but then as mature, they become more omnivorous. So young tea sur sea turtles will eat fish and fish eggs, also sea hare eggs, mollusks, bryozoans, small invertebrates, small insects, worms, sponges, algae, things like that. Uh, leaves and tree bark and even crustaceans. So that's what young sea turtles will eat. They also have a relatively slow growth rate because they're low nutrition, with body fat turning green because of the vegetation they eat. And the diet shift kind of changes uh, and has an effect on their skull morphology. So their serrated jaws help them chew up the red and green algae and moss and things like that. Sea lettuce and seaweed, things like that. So as they get older, they become more omnivorous. And uh, most adult sea turtles will actually become strictly herbivorous, feeding on sea grasses and algae and things like that. So there's a, a big change in their ecology as they grow up, which is really, really interesting. In terms of predators and parasites, these guys can be affected by a bunch of parasites like barnacles, leeches, things like that, uh, both in and, um, in and on their bodies. In terms of predators, though, really only large sharks will eat them. So like tiger sharks will feed them in, on in Hawaii. But juveniles, as the babies kind of get off the beach, they'll be fed upon by grass, uh, crabs and things like that. Also, other marine mammals will feed them when they're younger. When they're adults, they're pretty much fine, but they're eggs. And as babies, they can be eaten by jackals, foxes, shorebirds, things like that. So things like that, a lot of those things. So they actually will migrate long distances between feeding and nesting grounds, with some swimming up to 2,600 kilometers to reach their spawning grounds as well, uh, breeding grounds as well, which is quite interesting. So mature turtles will actually return to the exact beach they were born on, which is really, really interesting. And females will usually mate every two to four years, with males bre typically breeding every year, with mating seasons varying between the populations. So like in the Caribbean, they'll breed in like June to September. Uh, June to September. In the French Guiana, they'll breed from March to June. So it really just depends on the population and things like that. Sea turtles will return to the beach they were born on to lay their eggs. So what they'll do is they'll return to native beaches and climb on, and then they kind of dig their hole. Uh, and they actually will use natal homing, so they're able to remember the beach that they were born on. So they think, oh, I know this beach where I was born. I'll go there and lay my eggs. So that's why I'm, that's so that's why it's quite important to protect uh, sea turtle breeding sites, because that's where they will come back. And if they come back to basically a uh, beachfront with lots of people on it and something that's been destroyed, they're just it's a big issue for them. But anyway, they will come on, lay their eggs, and kind of uh, dig a hole, put them in, go back to sea. They're not very good mothers. They kind of lay them and then like you're on your own kind of thing but really interesting the mating behavior is quite similar to female turtles they actually uh popular uh will practice polyandry but that does not seem to benefit hashlings they'll mate in the water she'll move to the high tide and dig a hole and kind of go off and then do her thing as well they have quite white eggs uh that are about 1.8 inch or about 45 millimeters in diameter with the temperature they um they would determine the sex which is a big issue with climate change as well. In about 57 days, they'll hatch during the night and the babies will just head for the water, but this often leads them up to being um, eaten. So this makes it the most dangerous time in a turtle's life. So they'll be picked off by crabs and things like that. And then once they get to the water and survive, they'll spend the next three to five years in the open ocean, feeding on like fish and fish eggs and things like that, where they could get picked off by other animals. But they, once they reach about sexual maturity, about eight to nine years or so, uh, they'll get their, they'll basically become invincible and typically only 1% of hatchings will actually reach that stage though So that's quite interesting So in terms of breathing and sleeping these guys will spend almost their lives submerged But they must come up to breathe for oxygen and they actually can quickly replace air in their lungs with quite interesting so they can just expel it like a whale can and they can rest and sleep underwater for several hours of a time but submerges time is much shorter when dieting for food and escape predators so their breathing holding ability is affected by stress. So that's why turtles will quickly uh, drown in shrimp trawlers and things like that. So they get stressed and, like, mm, and they use more oxygen. So a lot of really interesting adaptions. They have good vision and they can see in color. Uh, they also will migrate long distances and be able to come back to the places where they were born. So it's pretty much found in all species of sea turtles and can be found in salmon and things. It's a really interesting phenomenon. So they believe to imprint on the beach they were born on and then kind of go back and things like that, which is really, really cool. They're also able to tolerate the constant heat loss in the water because they're able to shunt blood away from their tissues and are tolerant of quite low oxygen levels in the heart, brain and central nervous system. So other really cool adaptions for them to dive. 
And in terms of unique characteristics, they have six differences. So adult turtles, males, could be told apart because they have a longer tail and longer claws and flippers and things like that. And they also play quite an essential role in the ecosystems they live in. Uh, they live, they eat, of course, like seagrass beds and things like that. They'll feed on the seagrass and kind of trim them. And that improves the health of the growth of the seabeds. So basically just like maintains them. And healthy seagrass beds that turtles provide, they'll give habitat to many other species of fish and crustaceans. And species like the yellow tang uh, will swim along the turtle and uh, feed on the algae on the shell and flippers so they do are really important for the ecosystem uh, other fish will feed on kind of the shells and flippers to get the algae off uh, they maintain the kind of sea grasses as well which is really really interesting but in terms of their importance to humans they often were made to make handbags and things like that turtle soups another big thing the eggs are a delicacy people like to use things as ornaments and things but sadly they are considered an endangered species i believe uh, yeah, they are considered endangered, and that's because of quite a few reasons that we'll get into. So threats in, in, to these guys includes hunting, poaching, and egg harvesting, where they kill the adults and the babies, things like that. Uh, chemical po uh, pollution as well. Uh, harbors, actually, near nesting site can create disturbances. Light pollution actually can dist uh, distort or like, distract, uh, disorientate like the hatchlings, things like that. Chemical pollution, uh, tumors, things like that. Uh, really really bad for these guys climate change uh bycatch these guys are kind of particularly vulnerable to quite a few issues and that's caused them to be endangered and plastic as well they've been found with plastic in their stomachs as well so that's really really bad issues uh also uh metal poisoning with like uh pcbs and things like that and that's been a big issue and climate change because their babies are sex determinant by temperature so uh, the higher temperatures will mean that more of one sex will be born and that pretty much means you'll have a population that's mostly like mostly males or females which is not good of course because that reduces genetic diversity but there's luckily lots of global initiatives to go and try and protect these guys so um, the international union for conservation of nature is consistent them endangered uh, pretty much all the time and there have been some people trying to protect the beaches where they breed on some repopulation efforts as well to rehabilitate sea turtles they're quite common across the world even like the local aquarium uh here they take in sea turtles that are kind of cold stunned and kind of release them to uh survive which is quite cool uh lots of research and stuff to try and protect these guys because they're such a, char a charismatic species lots of protected areas and stuff and uh rehabilitation programs and protecting the neat beaches that they kind of breed on uh is a big thing as well so there is lots of big conservation efforts to protect these guys across the world so it's a great conservation story uh, i think in my opinion but yeah really really cool and yeah really awesome animals so leaf and jen and buffs who did a wonderful job remastering it it's nice to see a remaster so the aquaria pack's getting some love again but yeah really really cool just definitely just look at that beautiful turtle i know you guys love the green sea turtles so next up we've got by monsoon everyone loves monsoon uh, making some more seals again, but we've got everyone's favorite big bad seal. We have got here the in the water. Don't know what you're doing in the water there, but we have got here we've got the southern elephant seal. So really really cool. So the southern elephant seal is one of the two species of elephant seal. Uh, there is also the northern northern elephant seal that kind of lives around uh, North America and uh, Pacific Ocean things like that. We'll have a look at the females. Why not? We'll start off with that. So they are the largest member of the clade Pinnipe in the order Carnivora. So they are the largest uh, carnivorin. Uh, so they're bigger than basically polar bears and tigers and everything. And the largest extant marine mammal that is not a whale. So that's really interesting. They get their name because of their massive size and also the proboscis uh, that they have on the males, that the adult males have, that used to produce quite loud noises. And they usually will use that even, especially during the breeding season. They love that. Is this a baby? Oh, yeah, it's a baby. We'll have a look at the adults. Where's the adults? yeah have a look at you i don't think these guys let's just move you on to land i think you guys are having some issues with the terrain yeah we'll have a look at the females here we are so uh the bull actually southern elephant seal is 40 percent heavier than a male northern elephant seal and weighs twice as much as an adult walrus and six to seven times heavier than the largest non-terrestrial, uh, mostly terrestrial carnivorum. So like about seven times as big as a polar bear, six times as big as a polar bear. So it's really, really interesting. So the main way you can kind of distinguish them is other than where they live. 
uh, is the greater body mass and the shorter proboscis. So they basically are a little bit, they're bigger, but they have a shorter nose. And um, southern male seals also will prepare taller to fighting because they tend to bend their backs a lot stronger than the males as well. And they also exhibit, well, have a look at the male here since he's being such an interesting guy. They actually have the largest sexual dimorphism of any mammal in terms of its mass ratio. So males are typically five to six times heavier than the females, which is really, really interesting. So on average, a, ma a female elephant seal will be between 350 and 900 kilograms, or 770 to 1,980 pounds, and measure between 2.6 and 3 meters, so about 8.5 to 9.8 feet long, where the bulls get enormous. Bulls can get between... 1,500 to 3,700 kilograms, or between 3,300 pounds or 8,200 pounds, and grow between 4.9 to 5.8 meters, or about 15, 14 to 19 feet long in length, which is huge. And for comparison, the in terms of sexual dimorphism, the uh, this is a factor of six. Uh, sperm whales and northern elephant seals, which are two quite sexually dimorphic marine mammals, they only typically outweigh their females uh, by a factor of three to four. These guys are like so much bigger which is really really interesting let's see if you'll dive uh, southern elephant seals also uh the size will kind of uh, change a bit depending where they live some populations are bigger than others and the maximum weight for a female is about a thousand kilograms and a maximum weight for a male the largest one ever recorded was about 6.85 meters or 22 feet long and weighed about 500 kilograms so about five tons so really really huge for the largest individuals and you can see the southern elephant seal has quite a large brown, uh, large black eyes. And the width of the eyes in a high concentration have low light pigments. Suggests that they actually have quite important for catching prey because they're quite an interesting ecology, these guys. And like all seals, they have hind limbs who ends have a tail fluke. And they have four, five long web fingers as well. And they use their pectoral fins not that much when they're swimming. And when their hind limbs are unfit for locomotion, like they use their fins to kind of propel their bodies. And they can actually quite move quite fast, uh, up to 8 kilometers an hour, about 5 miles per hour, in short distance travel on the land to return the water, to chase off an intruder, or to catch up to a female. So they're actually quite good at moving on land in that regard. Uh, we'll have a look at the little puppies. We love little pups. Look how cute these little guys are. So these guys are born completely black, as you kind of see here. And the coats are unsuited for swimming, so they have to wait until they molt to be able to swim. And after they molt, their coat will become grey uh, or brown, depending on the thickness of the hair. And among older males, the skin will become more leathery because they get scarred. And like other seals, they have a vascular system that's actually quite well adapted for the cold. They have a mixture of small veins surrounded by arteries that catches the heat as well. So that's a really, really interesting adaptation that they have. Let's have a look at the... Let's see if you'll swim. Come on, swim for me. You're a pretty, you're a pretty seal, but anyway. So, in terms of their range of population, there was world estimated there was believed to be about six hundred fifty thousand uh, in the mid nineteen nineties, but the population is suggested to be now between six hundred sixty four, seven hundred forty thousand animals, uh, and suggested to be uh, divided between three different populations. So the largest subpopulation lives in South Atlantic, so there's more than 400,000 individuals, with 11, uh, 113,000 breeding females on South G uh, Georgia Island, with them living on the Falkland Islands as well. The second population lives in the Southern Indian Ocean, which comprise about 200,000 individuals. They believe on the Kalogan Islands and the Marion and Prince Edward Islands and even Amsterdam Islands as well. And the third population is believed to be about 75,000 and is found in the Subantarctic Islands of New Zealand and Tasmania and keep found in Macquarie Island. Though they did used to live on New Zealand itself, uh, they believe to uh, potentially have gone extinct because of hunting. Uh, they w there have been like evidence of these guys in like middens or like basically rubbish dumps by local uh, indigenous Maori people. Basically, it shows that they probably lived there and probably got wiped out because people ate them. It's a similar fate to the Moa, but luckily these guys lived in many other places so they didn't go extinct. But there are colonies. They live on like Tasmania, St. Helga, and even like uh, Juan Fernandez Islands. And some have been seen in like Australia, South Africa, and Uruguay. There's even been reports of these guys in like um, pretty much in like Singapore, which is really, really interesting. A very interesting vagrant species. So uh, by the end of the large scale uh, seal hunting, these guys have reduced to a decent population of like the 1950s. But since then, there's been a decline that's unexplained. Though other populations seem to be stable, but we don't know the evidence of the fluctuations. Could be climate change, could be competition, could be uh, basically how we monitor them could be wrong. 
But yeah, um, we'll have a look at the females since he's not going to die for us. Let's have a look at the females. So, in terms of their social behavior and reproduction, they are among the seals that stay onto land for the longest periods of time. They actually can stay dry for several consecutive weeks each year. Uh, males will arrive to colonies earlier than the females and fight for control of harems when they arrive. Uh, large body size confers advantages when fighting, so the bigger males typically get the biggest, uh, the best females or the most females. The dominant bulls, which are called harem masters, establish a harem of several females that they'll protect. So the least successful males will have no harems, but may try to copulate with a harem, uh, none of the ones, uh, uh, females when he's not looking and the majority of the females uh, will have a basically uh, mate and then some will be a uh, roaming males trying to get uh, away from harems as well elephant seals must kind of stay in defended territory so he must uh, defend his territory where all his females are so this could mean months without eating so he has to live off his blubber and two fighting males typically use their large canines and teeth to fight each other you know what we'll have a talk since we're talking about him we'll move over here they use their large canines and stuff to fight each other uh and use their weight to uh the outcomes are usually really fatal and they usually will uh flee uh however balls can suffer some quite severe cuts and things like that and some males will stay up short with like more than three months without food and they vocalize using that big proboscis like the where they get the name elephant seal they use that to communicate and kind of basically roar and stuff to say hey this is my this is my area don't mess with me so um after all that effort so hopefully he has sired a few pups and these pups as i mentioned born completely black uh they will uh bark or yap with a high pitch moan they typically uh the newborns will be begin to suckle immediately with lactation lasting about 23 days throughout this period the female will fast newborns typically will weigh about 40 kilograms at birth but reach uh, 120 to 130 kilograms by the time they are weaned. So between 88 pounds and up to about 260, 290 pounds when weaned. The mother uh, loses significant weight during this time, and young weaned seals will uh, kind of uh, gather in nurseries until they lose their birth coats. And then they'll enter the water to practice swimming and then uh, kind of swim in like pools and estuaries and then kind of return to the sea, sh uh, come ashore to molt. And this sometimes will directly happen after reproduction. So in terms of their feeding and diving, these guys got a very interesting feeding ecology. Oh, there he's diving. Where is he? There he is. So in terms of their feeding ecology, these guys uh, spend actually very little time on the surface and they spend a few minutes breathing. So in terms of their diving, they'll dive repeatedly every like no more than like t uh, 20 minutes. So they hunt their prey, which is typically squid and fish, at depths of about 400 to 1,000 meters or 1,300 to 1,300 meters. So this makes them the deepest diving, air-breathing, non-cetacean to be recorded at maximum of 2,388 meters, or about 7,835 feet in depth. So of the duration, kind of depth, and sequence of these dives, these guys seem to be the best performing seals. In fact, they actually can dive a lot better than a lot of cetaceans. They, this kind of uh, results of their non-standard uh, adaptations and stuff compared to a lot of the marine mammals, uh, which is weird. And the coping strategy is basically just increase oxygen storage and reduce oxygen consumption. So in the ocean, the seals would typically live alone, with most females diving in the pelagic zone, uh, zone while the males would live in both Becknick and pelagic zones. Individuals will return annually to the same hunting sites, and due to the inaccessibility of the deep water like foliage, uh, foraging areas, no comprehensive information has been seen on their preferences, but we know they kind of eat a lot of fish and squid and things like that. While hunting in the dark depths, they seem to use their eyes to locate their prey because they look at the blue eye luminescence of some of the animals they eat and they're like, oh, I see you. I'll go and grab you. And they do not seem to have uh, echolocation like uh, cetaceans, but they do have whiskers or fibrisarae, which are quite sensitive to vibrations that allow them to kind of search out food. And when on the subarctic to Antarctic coast, they'll feed on like lots of deep sea cephalopods and mollusks and they feed on like lantern fish and nothoterns and things like that or krill is another thing they'll even believe to eat algae and crustaceans so definitely quite a varied diet in that regard but in terms of their predation these guys typically don't have many predators though weaned pups and juveniles may fall prey to orcas uh they're also elephant seals and new zealand sea lions have been known to kill small pups uh also uh, they've been eaten by great white sharks have hunted elephant seals on the campbell island with bite marks of a southern sleeper seal being seen on elephant seals on crow island Though typically adults are safe from most things, even like the bulls, uh, they're typically safe from orcas. So I'm sure there's been a few that's tried because I know they even hunt blue whales. So an elephant seal wouldn't be too high compared to a blue whale. 
I imagine. But they typically avoid uh, large bull seals, but they will attack females. But in terms of conservation, they are considered least concerned, as I mentioned. They were one of the victims of hunting during kind of the... Um, like the late 19th century, these guys were really hunted uh, for their uh, fur and things like that. Uh, but through the near extinction, their population has kind of recovered between 664,000 and 740,000. Uh, but in 2002, there were two of the three populations which were to be declining. Their conservation story is actually a lot uh, more uh, uh, interesting. Or, or they did much better. They fared much better after than the Northern Elephant Seal, which was like reduced to like a couple hundred individuals of that, I think. So these guys, uh, in terms of their conservation, they by the end of the hunting period of uh, the end 19th century, where the people stopped at hunting seals, these guys were doing much better. And luckily, they where they live, they tend to avoid people. They tend to breed on uh, uh, subantarctic islands, which uh, no people live on, and are considered like UNESCO sites as well. But in terms of conservation, they could also be suffering from climate change, also uh, bycatch, things like that. And it's been actually quite a bit of research looking to the uh, effects on climate change on these guys. And it's believed that these guys are potentially one of the most vulnerable to climate change because of like uh, changes in currents and things like that could potentially uh, reduce the availability of food. So that's something that, that could be a great indicator of that, but they could be affected by climate change. They're a good conservation success story because they've come back from extinction, though the northern elephant seal is probably a better one because they came back from basically like a few hundred, if that. I believe it's even like 50 at some point. Uh, but they're a great example of conservation. But um, they're an animal that is a great indicator and quite important in ecosystems of saying, oh, there's something not right here and a good advocate for climate change because and a good way of researching the impact of climate change on these guys because uh, these guys live in the Arctic and they're quite dependent on a lot of these currents and things like that. So a great kind of like canary in the coal mine, so to speak. So yeah, a really, really cool animal. Definitely love the elephant seal. So you can see that wonderful male. Monsoon always does a wonderful job. Uh, great improvement from Didim's one back in the day, but yeah, really, really cool. We've got the male and the female, and then we have the cute little black pups. So cute. So Monsoon always kills it. So, really, really awesome mod. And so this will be a great place to end the video. So thank every. I uh, want to thank everyone for making their awesome mods. Love covering these. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always forget the little bell icon to get notified below anything. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, hope you guys like and subscribe and. Bye-bye.